chilling new details about life inside that home where 13 children were held captive. Their parents are now facing possible life in prison. Our senior national correspondent, Matt Gutman, has been tracking the case for us and joins us from that house in Paris, California. Good morning, Matt. Hey, good morning, Robin. The DA in an interview last night told me that the abuse suffered in that house was, quote, off the charts sadistic. Now, David and Louise Turpin are accused not only of beating their children, chaining them to bed, sometimes for months at a time, but also systematically starving their children and taunting them. Sometimes they would buy things like apple pie, pumpkin pie, put it on the counter, let the kids smell it, but never eat it. There were toys in that house that were unwrapped, and now those two parents face up to 75 total counts, and if convicted, up to life in prison. The parents who police say routinely chained up their children now in shackles themselves, facing the first rung of justice in court. The people of the state of California versus Louise Ann Turpin and David Allen Turpin. David and Louise Turpin pleading not guilty to a combined 75 counts of torture, abuse, and imprisonment of their children spanning decades. If convicted, they could face life in prison. District Attorney Mike Hestron detailing the deeply disturbing alleged physical and mental abuse, including starving their children and then taunting them with delicacies. They would buy food, including pies, apple pies, pumpkin pies, leave it on the counter, let the children look at it, but not eat the food. Instead of food, the children were fed a steady diet of cruelty. These pictures show one of their Texas homes years ago, grime smeared on the stairwells, human filth on the floors. The district attorney saying the children were allowed to bathe only once a year and none of the victims had ever seen a dentist. And the punishments for infractions like washing their hands above the wrists progressively got worse. First with ropes, one victim at one point was tied up and hog tied and then when that victim was able to escape the, the ropes, uh, these defendants eventually began using chains and padlocks to chain up the victims to their beds. The one thing the children were allowed were journals. A surprising hole in the Turpin's fortress of deprivation. DA Mike Hestron believes the hundreds of journals could prove significant going forward. My guess is that they're gonna be, that's gonna be powerful evidence about what was happening from the perspective of the victims, what was happening in that house. So your understanding is that they were actually able to document what was happening to them in their journals in almost like a real-time basis? That, that's my assumption, and, and I, do, I do believe that that's going to be the case, yes. Doctors are now treating the siblings, one of whom is 29 years old and weighs just 82 pounds. That medical staff also acting as their guardians, and they're hopeful for their future. We've limited the type of physicians that go in to see them. We've used people that we knew that they could develop a bond with and trust. And um, we feel that we've done the best for them while they're here. Now, one of the things that gives investigators and doctors hope is the courage and grit displayed by that 17-year-old girl who managed to escape. Apparently, she had been plotting this for over two years. She went out there with a sibling. That sibling got so afraid, she turned back. But that 17-year-old pushed forward, managed to contact authorities, and they say possibly save her siblings. Robin. Okay, Matt, just can't stop thinking about all those children. Thank you. We're going to bring in our chief legal analyst, Dan Abrams. He's here in the studio with us. And Callahan Walsh, who is a child advocate from the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, joins us as well. Dan, let me start with you. We just heard in Matt's piece about those journals. That's going to be powerful. And it's going to be really important uh, evidence because they're documenting day by day uh, what is apparently happening to them. And look, keep in mind, this is occurring over a period of years. So I wouldn't be surprised if, as they continue to investigate this, as they continue to go through the journals, as they uh, continue to find out more about this family, they could end up adding additional charges beyond the, the 75 uh, that, that Matt has talked about here. But it's rare to have that kind of real-time documentation of alleged crimes. And it makes you wonder, what's the defense going to be? Yeah. I mean, 
I don't know. I don't have. Is, are they going to claim some sort of religious freedom defense? I don't know. But when you have that sort of evidence, it's hard to figure out how you defend. Homeschooling has been brought up a lot, and in California, all you need is a simple registration. In some states, even less than that. Well, well, that's right. A lot of people are talking about what needs to be done now. Homeschooling, in and of itself, isn't the problem. Uh, the problem is that in a disproportionate number of cases where you have horrible abuse, the kids were homeschooled. So, what does that mean? doesn't mean you need to end homeschooling. It means, I think, that you need to have some form of, of regulation. You need to have some checking in. It's at school where people are able to determine where something happens to True. a child. Mm -hmm. and, that's, and that's the issue. All right, Dan. Dan uh, Callahan, let's talk about those, those precious children. And as we heard in the report, uh, the 17-year-old who was so brave and had been planning this for so long and had a sibling, and the sibling turned back, but thankfully the other went forward. Just explain the psychology behind this. Uh, the bravery that she displayed is amazing. Mm -hmm. You know, this case reminds me so much of the Cleveland girls, Amanda Berry, Gina De Jesus, and Michelle Knight. Those girls were kidnapped by an abductor and, and held against their will. These kids were brought up uh, in this abuse from day one. Uh, so just to know that, that something was wrong, uh, that, that she needed to do something, I know they had very little knowledge of the outside world. In fact, these kids didn't even know what a police officer was. So for, for her to be able to, to understand something was wrong and, and, and to, to break out of that situation, not only did she save her own life, but the life of her, her 12 other siblings as well. Callahan, as you were talking, we were showing video of the family um, with, out in public, and we've seen them um, on vacation and that, and you know what some people feel when they see pictures like this, they're like, well, why didn't the children do something at that point? But y y please explain again why that's so difficult for them. Right, again, we've seen this in other cases like Elizabeth Smart. When she was abducted, she was seen out in public as well. But these abductors, and, and in this case, unfortunately, these kids' parents, uh, are using a control-based and fear-based control system. Uh, and with that, these kids think that their parents are the ultimate authority, uh, that there's no one else out there that, that, can, that can, can save them, and they are fearing those parents. And so this, this fear-based control is, is what kept these kids uh, locked in that house for so long. They, they did have opportunities outside uh, to get away, but we saw... The, the parents control. They would uh, dress them all in the same outfits. They mm -hmm. would line them up in lines whenever they would go on anywhere and uh, stand at the front and the back of the lines and, and, and make sure that, that they were completely watched at all times. All right, Callahan. As always, we appreciate your insight. And Dan, thank Hard you. Hard to even talk about. It is. Yeah. It really yeah. is. It really is. And there's so much more to talk about it in this case, including brand new details and interviews. And you can see it on a special hour of 2020. That's tonight. Hi everyone, George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching.